We recently visited the Hunter Fighter Collection in Scone, New South Wales, where we discovered a remarkable collection of historical aircraft, most of them airworthy. Established in 2019, the collection boasts a wide range of aircraft, and in this video, we will take you through them, with Public Officer John Parker as our guide. Here's John introducing us to the collection. My name's John Parker, and I'm the Public Officer of the Hunter Fighter Collection. We were established in 2019. We're a registered not-for-profit organisation. With We have full uh, DGR tax status, so we're a, cha a charitable organisation. Um, we're established basically to preserve and restore Australian-based aircraft, Australian-manufactured aircraft, and uh, aircraft from the RAAF, from the RAF, and from aggressor um, nations across the world. The theme that we have in, in the Hunter Fighter Collection is basically fighters and trainers. We tend not to go in for largest types of aircraft. You've got to pick something, so we pick that. We're in partnership with Hunter Warbirds, which is a magnificent organisation established by the Upper Hunter Shire Council. We've got a magnificent museum facility, which you'll see in other uh, video. This was built and opened about 18 months ago. Um, we had assistance from the Commonwealth and State Governments to build the facility. Um, it's one of the best aircraft museums, in my opinion, in the Southern Hemisphere. We have the majority of our aircraft in the collection fly. They're um, airworthy aircraft. Some of them fly on a regular basis, some of them less regularly. We also have a collection of um, static aircraft, mainly jets from the RAAF, that have been donated by the RAAF and by private benefactors. To support the organisation and its goals, we have a, a large staff of volunteers, principally XRAAF staff, but we also have a collection of other volunteers from the whole Hunter Valley. We have people come as far as far away as Sydney to work on the aircraft. The standard of all of the workmanship that they uh, display when they're doing restorations is stunning. I'm really impressed with the work that we turn out here on a regular basis. Um, so we support the Upper Hunter Shire Council and Hunter Warbirds in providing all the aircraft and exhibits in the facility over there and the Upper Hunter Shire Council looks after the facility itself. So that's the arrangement. Um, one of our major signature projects at the moment is the restoration of the aircraft that Patterson Clarence Hughes flew in the Battle of Britain. Um, it's a Mark I Spitfire that we've uh, managed to have donated to us by Ross and Anne-Marie Pay. Um, that aircraft is being restored at the moment. It will be restored to fly and it will be flown out of the museum here. It'll remain in Australia forever. We're very lucky to partner with Vintage Fighter Restorations, part of the Pay's organisation here, in as much as they've already built three Spitfires, two Kitty Hawks and two Mustangs to fly. So they have the expertise that we need to make our project succeed. So we partner with them as well. So it's, uh, it's an all encompassing organisation, but at the heart of it is that team of volunteers. We've got over 30 volunteers that work here. They're all um, very professional in the way they go about their business, but they also have a fantastic team ethic. So I'm very proud to be the public officer of this organisation. And I'd certainly welcome anyone to come and have a visit to Scone, to Hunter Warbirds. It's um, been open for a little bit over 12 months now and it's gaining popularity. We've had quite a lot of um, global recognition. We've had donations of aircraft from the RAF Museum. We received a Mustang and a Vampire from the RAF Museum recently. Um, we've had recognition by the US Air Force Museum. We've had recognition all over the world for the, the we punch well above our weight in that respect. Um, we are widely regarded and respected globally. So that's a short overview, if you like, of Hunter Fighter Collection. John took us to the main display hangar for the collection and took us through each of the aircraft which have been presented in an immaculate lineup. So during World War I, there was a, a entrepreneur called Charles Elmer Baker and he established the Australian Battle Plane Fund. And the Australian Battle Plane Fund basically meant that citizens of Australia, either individuals or communities, could donate £2,700 and pay for an aircraft. So the Upper Hunter and the Hunter Shire um, in New South Wales during the First World War 
donated a significant amount of money, both individual landowners and communities within the small towns. What we've got here is representative of two of those aircraft. They're Bristol fighters, but a number of different types of aircraft were donated. So the one on the right represents the Bristol fighter that was donated by the local community around Stone. Um, it's called the Upper Hunter battle plane. All of the uh, aircraft that were donated had the inscription written on the side of them. The one on the left, which is a flying replica of one of the aircraft, was donated by one of the local landholders, the McIntyre family. Funnily enough, the great grandson of the gentleman that donated this still works within this community here in aviation, so it's quite a tie up. This particular aircraft represents B1229, which was the aircraft flown by Sir Ross Smith in Palestine in the desert. Um, it's quite a historic aircraft in terms of that serial identity. Not only was it flown by Sir Ross Smith, the aircraft is the highest uh, kill or victory number aircraft in the Australian Flying Corps at the time. 17 aircraft were shot down by this, uh, by this particular Bristol fighter. And it was also the aircraft in which Lawrence of Arabia did his reconnaissance flights over Palestine during that conflict, flown by Sir Ross Smith. So a very, very fascinating bit of local history and something that we celebrate here quite a lot. There'll be an additional Bristol fighter added to our collection, a flying one next year. So we'll be one of the few collections in the world with two flying Bristol fighters. So a very significant thing and uh, something we're very proud of. So this aircraft is a DH-60. It's the oldest flying aircraft in Australia on the Civil Register, DH-UAE. It's um, quite a historic aircraft in its own right. It was also the first aircraft exported to Australia by uh, de Havilland's in the UK. It has a significant Australian history and we're very lucky that the owner lends it to uh, Hunter Fighter Collection and obviously to Hunter Warbirds to display here. Um, it flies quite successfully, it flies very well. It's a, it's a magnificent old aircraft. It has RAAF history too, in that it was, um, during World War II, it flew with the RAAF um, as a training aircraft. And it's something that we really value here, being the oldest flying aircraft in Australia. So this aircraft is a de Havilland Tiger Moth. Um, it's a significant aircraft to Scone and to our collection, and it was one of the first crop dusting aircraft owned by um, Cole Pay, who was um, a doyen of Australian warbirds. This particular aircraft served in World War II as a training aircraft. Um, it had quite an extensive RAAF history. After that, it was eventually acquired by Cole Pay, um, originally at Narromine and then over here later on as a uh, crop dusting aircraft and a uh, fertilising aircraft. So again, quite a significant aircraft. It gives us a Tiger Moth in the collection, but it has the added benefit of being both a military aircraft and a very significant civil aircraft in its crop dusting role. Um, it was the backbone, obviously, during World War II of the training fleets for the RAAF in Australia. So again, a very significant airplane. The Harvard T-6 uh, type of SNJ training aircraft was used extensively by Australians who trained in Canada and in the UK during World War II, quite a lot of Australian fighter pilots learnt their skill set on the Harvard. This particular Harvard belonged to Cole Pay, the originator of a lot of the aircraft in the collection. Um, it is a significant aircraft in as much as it won several awards at Oshkosh for Cole acquired it in the 1980s. Um, it flies extensively. It is a very nice aircraft to fly. Doesn't have many vices. Um, Quite a, quite a significant aircraft to the collection. The only irritating factor about this particular aircraft is the constant polishing, but otherwise very welcome aircraft in our collection. Um, again, this is another significant aircraft in the collection. It's a flying Mark 9 Spitfire. Its uh, wartime registration was MH6A3, and it's been restored in its original color scheme as it served with a Norwegian squadron during World War II. Had quite a bit of operational service, um, and was uh, recovered from as a wreck in South Africa after post-war. Um, this particular aircraft was restored from the ground up by Vintage Fighter Restorations, which is part of the Pays Group. 
It's the third Spitfire that was restored to flying condition here at Scone. Uh, there are another four Spitfires in the production line at the moment here in Scone. Um, and this is a significant aeroplane in as much as it um, represents a flying Spitfire, which was uh, until a few years ago, almost unheard of in Australia. It's quite a, a beautiful aircraft to fly, according to the pilots that fly it. It's probably one of the nicest restored Spitfires in the world. So we're very lucky to have it here at the moment. While we were at the collection, we managed to talk to some of the people working on these magnificent aircraft. Here's Michael explaining how he got involved. I got involved or exposed to Hunter Warbirds probably about 18 months ago. Um, my father was uh, in the RAF during World War II when I heard rumours that there was a Mark V being restored up here. And so I came up and had the opportunity to meet with the guys up here who uh, were behind Hunter Warbirds. And um, it all went from there. My father's now passed on, but he sort of imbued the fashion of, of dealing with old, old Warbirds and I guess the folklore that goes with the guys who served. Um, if it wasn't for uh, his time in Darwin during World War II, I wouldn't be here. So um, that's been a great sort of godsend. And, and I love tinkering with stuff. My daughter now is in the RAAF. She's um, almost through uh, the process of pilot training. So she's picked up the, uh, the bug as well. Um, but I love tinkering. I'm an engineer by background, although I haven't done that for a long time, but it gives a chance to play around and build and fabricate parts that need to be done and uh, help look after these fantastic machines we have around us so that uh, they're there for enjoyment for people in the future. The volunteer workforce is really important to organisations such as this. Most uh, museums that are volunteer based have struggled to get hold of vol uh, volunteers. We're very fortunate we've got a, a really good crew that come from all parts of the country. I, I, come, I drive three and a half hours to get here each, each week. Um, but it's worth the effort to do so because you get guys who are actually grew up actually working on these aircraft in their working life. Great bunch of people to work with and um, the passion that you have both in terms of the mechanical, technical side and also the other ancillary stuff about events and fundraising and other things that are just quintessentially essential for an organisation like this is just fantastic. Um, I've already managed to rope in a couple of friends to come along and help in various forms. So. I'm very pleased that I'm able to pass the bug on as well. After a quick break over lunch at the cafeteria, John continued to take us through the collection. Again, another one of our flying aircraft here in Scone. This particular Kitty Hawk behind me was um, restored here to flying condition and has been with the collection since about 2007. It's finished in the colour scheme of uh, Bobby Gibbs, who was one of Australia's highest scoring aces during the Second World War and Bobby was able to see this uh, fly um, shortly before he died um, in, in 2007. It's a significant aeroplane in as much as it represents uh, the RAAF effort in, the, in North Africa. Um, it's actually been signed by Bobby Gibbs before he passed away. It's um, a wonderful aeroplane to fly again, according to the pilots. It has no major vices. And it's always a spectacular thing to see flying in air shows and displays across Australia. So again, another one of our most significant aeroplanes. So this particular aircraft is the first of the static aircraft that we're going to show you. This is uh, an aircraft gifted to us by the RAAF. It's a complete Mackie in every respect. Um, it's one of the most immaculate aeroplanes we've had to work with. Fortunately, it didn't require a lot of restoration as some of the other jets you'll see later do. It was the primary training aircraft for the RAAF in the Hunter Valley down at Williamtown. It's flown by a lot of very significant pilots over the years. We're very pleased to have it in the collection because it represents a significant type. It's also the first jet aircraft that we received here at Hunter Warbirds and Hunter Fighter Collection. So we're very proud of it. We're very uh, grateful to the RAAF for donating it to us. So this is a uh, RAAF Mirage 3 fighter aircraft. We received this aircraft about three years ago and it was in a fairly bad condition after having been externally uh, displayed for a number of years. Required a huge amount of work by the volunteers here to get it in the state that, that it, you'll see it today. This is um, um, also an aircraft that was flown by some very significant RAAF pilots and we're very happy to have it here. We're also very happy that we're able to get considerable number of spare parts that were required for its successful restoration. 
that the volunteer team here have probably put more hours into this restoration than any other aircraft you'll see. And it's a credit to them and it's a wonderful thing to be displaying here. It's privately owned and it's on loan to us for about 10 years and uh, after that we'll see what happens then. But a wonderful aircraft to have here and quite a draw card. So this particular aircraft is a Hawker Hunter. Uh, you might wonder what that's doing in a Hunter Valley fighter collection. This particular aircraft served at least three tours at Williamtown as a training aircraft with the Singaporean Air Force. As such, we felt it was a very desirable aircraft to have in our collection. It's also an example of a Cold War fighter. So um, that's the main reason it's here. When we received it, it was again in very bad condition and took a tremendous amount of work by the volunteers here to restore. We chose rather than put it in its Singaporean colour scheme to put it in its original RAF colour scheme. It now represents an aircraft from 20 Squadron RAF. And uh, again, it's a very attractive aircraft to have in the collection, but also a very significant aircraft. So again, we're very proud of this and uh, the work that's gone into it by the volunteer team in Hunter Fighter Collection. With the Hawker Hunter, the uh, armament system for the four 30 millimeter cannons fits in in a cassette type arrangement where the whole gun pack fits up into the fuselage of the aircraft. It can then be removed and if necessary, a reconnaissance camera pack can be placed in there. So we keep this on display alongside just to show the utility of it. We do have a reconnaissance pack coming for it, which will again be displayed alongside this particular aircraft. It was a very versatile and a very popular fighter during the 50s and 60s. So therefore, this um, certainly portrays the versatility of the aircraft. What we have here is a LIM-5-6 aircraft. Uh, which is the Polish built version of the MiG-17 fighter. Um, this particular aircraft has been restored by Hunter Fighter Collection. It was don donated to us by Jack McDonald. Um, it's a complete aircraft in every respect. Um, the particular color scheme that it's in, we've refurbished it as a, as a MiG-17, as an adversary aircraft, as faced by Australians and American forces in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And as such, it's our only, at the moment, our only aggressor aircraft in the collection. But it is significant in the role that it played during the Vietnam War. So we're very happy to have it, very proud of it. it again, it was a huge restoration task by the team here, and it is now in immaculate condition. So this aircraft behind me is our most recent uh, acquisition to Hunter Fighter Collection, Hunter Warbirds. This particular aircraft was gifted to us by the RAF Museum, as well as a vampire single seat jet aircraft in a competitive tender arrangement. They were disposing of some un unneeded aircraft in the UK. We're very, very proud to be awarded this and the vampire, which will be here later this year. Um, the particular aircraft was uh, received just prior to Anzac Day this year. Um, we put it together as a team, the Hunter Vite Fighter Collection technical team put this together in a period of three days, which was quite amazing. Uh, it's been on display ever since. The aircraft itself is finished in the colour scheme of Jack Cleland, who was the only New Zealander that we know of that ever served with the 8th Air Force. So it has an Anzac co connection. Um, we don't know too many other Commonwealth pilots that ever served with the 8th Air Force, so it has quite a connection here. Um, Jack Cleland's relatives now live in the Hunter Valley, so it has added relevance there. So we're very proud of this, and in, in the future it'll be here for, for quite some years. We may eventually try to uh, restore it to airworthy condition, but in the meantime we're very proud to have it on display the way it is. For our visit, John had arranged for the daughter of Jack Cleland, Alison Lee, to talk to us about her very emotional experience of seeing her father's aircraft restored as it is. So uh, my dad, um, Jack Cleland, um, was a fighter pilot during World War II. He, he was from New Zealand and um, actually did his training in the UK. Um, that's where he met my mother, um, who was an English, um, she was actually a professional ballet dancer, but when war broke out, she was encouraged to join ENSA, which is the Entertainment of National Servicemen Abroad. And uh, she and Dad actually met, I believe, in a troop ship um, off Africa. So uh, she was essentially a war bride then, and she followed my father, or he followed her actually back to New Zealand, where 
um, with my two older brothers and um, my other brother and myself were born in New Zealand later. Um, my dad actually passed away in 1970. He was quite young. I was a rebellious teenager then. <laughs> um, so I didn't really learn a lot of his war history. And like many, um, many men of that time, he was not that reluctant to share. I'm sure he did with his mates, but not with his family. And, and, and. So it wasn't until um, really 1998 when we were contacted by warbirds over Wanaka and our family was invited to be guests of honour along with Chuck Yeager. And we were down there for a fabulous weekend, um, over Easter, four days of, of a wonderful, wonderful air show. And uh, they actually had, again, a replica of Isabel that you'll see behind me there, not, not this one, but they painted up another one as a, as a replica. And it was actually, um, they, they rebuilt it with an extra seat in it and my mum was able to go for a flight in it all over the the, uh, the airfield there and actually did a couple of barrel rolls, which was the highlight of her life. <laughs> um, and then um, I, I was living in Australia at this time. And as far as I knew, this um, this plane had only been you know painted up for that occasion. Um, but we had donated or lent um, a lot of dad's memorabilia to the Wanaka Museum. Um, Time goes by and uh, my mum passed away in 2000 and I had a lot of dad's memorabilia that she had left for me. Um, my daughter Fiona married a young man called Murray Ross who was actually in the Australian Air Force. Um, and he was very interested in my father's history and we always sort of said that he only married my daughter to, because he, he knew that she was Jack Cleland's um, granddaughter. Um, so last year, I was, I was not aware of this, but um, last year at some stage, Murray discovered somewhere on Facebook that this aircraft behind me, which we had always believed to be in the Cosford Museum in the UK, was actually on its way to Australia. Um, the Hunter Warbirds having made a successful bid for it and um, winning that bid over many, many other um, museums, I understand. And he contacted, I think, um, John and established the relationship between uh, me being in Newcastle and the plane coming to Scone. And between them all, they cooked up this plan to um, surprise me. <laughs> so on Anzac Day this year, my son-in-law told me that we were going for a drive. He'd pick me up at eight o'clock in the morning and we were going for a drive. Where are we going, Murray? It's Anzac Day, you should be marching. And he said, oh, never mind, we're just going for a drive. Be ready at eight o'clock and we ended up here in Scone. And I walked in, there were a lot of cars here, a lot of people, and he uh, shepherded me through the crowds and out onto the tarmac, and here is this plane. And I'm, I'm, my immediately, I sort of ruffled, I was, you know, what are they doing, you know, painting up a plane like this and not telling me, you know? Um, and then I walked around the back and saw um, Isabel III, and I really just, I, I couldn't believe it. It, it was it was Isabel III and, and she was here on my doorstep in Skye. Okay, so what we have here is a BAC Strike Master aircraft. It's a, uh, as it says in its name, a strike aircraft. This particular aircraft is our only flying jet at the moment, and that's the reason it's in the collection. It represents, um, again, a 70s, 80s design, um, extensively flown all over the world. We're very proud to have it as a flying jet, and it'll stay with the collection um, probably for another 12 to 18 months. So again, it's a visiting aircraft donated. Uh, the, the stay it has here is donated by the owner of the aircraft. And we hope it'll be with us for, as I said, up to 18 months. So the aircraft behind me is a Windjail. It's an Australian designed and built training aircraft that served with the RAAF. 
Most of the aircraft, most of the wind drills were training aircraft, but some of them were converted as the one behind me is to forward air control training duties and they served at Williamtown. Um, at any given time, four of the wind drill fleet out of the total of 75 were forward air control aircraft. Um, this particular aircraft is airworthy and flies quite frequently. It's part of the Pays Aviation Fleet, um, part of Vintage Fighter Restorations, which is a Pays company. It's a magnificent aircraft to fly in. It has very few vices and it is a magnificent aircraft also as a training aircraft when you're uh, training pilots to fly some of the other aircraft that we've got in here. They have to start somewhere, so this is uh, a very good start. As part of the Australian aviation industry over the years, this was a very significant achievement. The, the wind drill is regarded as one of the best training aircraft of its day. And that, that's qu saying quite a lot when you consider some of the American and British designs. So again, another great aircraft to have here. Particularly good that it's in the forward air control scheme. That looks much, to my, to my eyes, looks much better than the training scheme. So the aircraft behind me is a Boeing Stearman. Um, this particular aircraft is of a type that was flown by many Australians, uh, both in Canada and the US, uh, as part of the Empire Pilot Training Scheme. It was a fairly ubiquitous aircraft in the US in terms of training during World War II. Many thousands of them were built. A particular example behind me is said to have been owned by Steve McQueen, the movie actor. He owned the aircraft for 12 years. It's probably the newest aircraft in the collection in that it was just recently restored at Luscan Tire and joined the Pays fleet following that. Um, it's available for, for joy flights at any time anybody would like to book to fly in this aircraft. I think it's um, got a special, special place in my heart because I was quite a Steve McQueen fan. But it's a magnificent example of the type and we're very happy to have this in the collection. It'll be here on permanent exhibition at Hunter Warbirds. The aircraft behind me is another one of the uh, flying aircraft here at Hunter Fighter Collection, Hunter Warbirds, Scone. This particular aircraft is, uh, being a Cessna bird dog, it's of a type flown by many Australians in Vietnam as um, on secondment to the US Air Force. The particular aircraft behind me was recovered by uh, Cole Pay, who recovered many of these aircraft also recovered some Cessna bird dogs and T-28s and a whole lot of other aircraft. The aircraft is significant in as much as, as it was flown um, fairly heroically by some Australians and assisted in the recovery of many downed airmen in, in that theatre of war. It also used to mark targets. They used to fit smoke rockets to the wings on these. So again, it's another iconic aircraft in our collection and it does fly from time to time. We finished our tour of the Hunter Fighter collection back at the workshop, where John showed us around all of the ongoing maintenance and restoration projects. So this aircraft here is um, a CAC Mustang built in Australia. Um, this is probably the oldest registered warbird in Australia, civilly run military aircraft. It's been pretty much in continuous service since, since it was constructed in the late 1940s. Um, the reason it's in the workshop at the moment is it's due for a total uh, restoration because it's been served in service for so long. It happens to all aircraft. Um, believe it or not though, it has very low hours. So hopefully there's not too much in it to be uh, repaired or reconstructed. It's just that it's in need of a full strip down and rebuild. So that's what's going on with this Mustang at the moment. Um, it's... Um, probably the most significant warbird in Australia in terms of its history. So, very proud to have it in our collection. It normally lives over in the Hunter Warbirds collection over there. But again, a magnificent aeroplane. I'll take you over now and just show you one of the projects our volunteers are working on. So this is a reproduction of a Supermarine Spitfire Mark I. This is to be used in fundraising to go with the Pat Hughes um, Spitfire Airworthy restoration that we're doing. It'll be touring around air shows and corporate events and that sort of thing once it's constructed. Um, it will be in the colour scheme of Pat Hughes X4009 Mark I Spitfire. 
it's, um, as I said, totally a fundraising exercise at this point in time. Um, we intend to have it as a travelling exhibition on a trailer. On this side, the skin will never be fitted so that people can see the internal construction of a Spitfire. Um, we'll, we'll fully kit it out with the internals, but we won't put any skin on it so people can actually see. So we'll go over to the other side. So this is the skinning that's going on at the moment on the uh, Spitfire fuselage. It's been quite a, an epic event. Um, it takes a long time to retrain people that have never riveted in terms of how to do it properly. So we're very lucky that the team at Vintage Fighter Restorations have actually shown the volunteers um, how to do riveting in a proper and professional manner. So this, is, this represents about four or five months solid work by our volunteers. We're very close to finishing the construction of the skin. Once this skin goes on it and gets painted, we'll fit out the fuselage with all the internal parts. It'll come out of this jig and go into another one suitable for transport around to air shows. But a magnificent effort on our volunteers' behalf. They've, um, they've certainly shown a skill set that nobody would imagine it'd have um, 80 years later after construction of a Mark I Spitfire. This Spitfire restoration project is inspiring to say the least, and we will leave you with a fundraising video that's supporting this initiative. But before we do, we would just like to thank John and everyone at the Hunter Fighter Collection for giving us so much of their time to show us around and give us such a grand tour. It was certainly worth the many hours of travel from Queensland to see this collection. I'm John Parker and I'm the public officer of the not-for-profit organisation Hunter Fighter Collection. We were uh, gifted the aircraft by Ross and Anne-Marie Pay, who generously donated it as a ongoing memorial to Patterson Clarence Hughes, Australia's highest scoring Battle of Britain pilot. Uh, it's very much an unknown story that needs to be made public. I was able to acquire X4009 through a, a friend of mine that I've been involved with uh, a long time in the UK. He first told me about this Spark One Spitfire because of the Australian connection and then the more he told me about it, it was just, this is unbelievable. And, how has this story not been told before? Spitfire Mark 1A X4009 is probably the most significant remaining Spitfire in the world. It is the Battle of Britain aircraft with the highest kill number left. It'll be one of only four Mark 1A Spitfires flying, which makes it the rarest and most prestigious aircraft but also being the aircraft of Patterson Clarence Hughes, who's Australia's top scoring ace, and he was the only person to ever fly the aircraft operationally once it was delivered. The fact that the Mark I Spitfire is obviously the rarest Spitfire of them all, and the fact that there's this untold story of Pat Hughes being Australia's greatest ace from the Battle of Britain, the highest scoring Australian in the Battle of Britain, was just an unbelievable story. And uh, the more you look into the story and what he achieved in such a short time, uh, it's just unbelievable and you couldn't help but really become enthused about the whole project. He was a true hero. He was very brave in his uh, fighting. He got used to get far too close to the aircraft that he was shooting down. He was renowned for his instinct and his accuracy and his ability as a pilot. You know, young bloke, born in Cooma, travels to the other side of the world to help defend the Australia and England and the fact that he gave up his life at such a young age and you know obviously with 17 kills to his name he was more than a fair pilot and marksman. So in terms of aircraft that are restored quite often you don't get a significant amount of wreckage but with this particular aircraft we estimated it's well over 400 kilos or over 40 to 60 percent of the wreck uh, depending on how you measure a wreck. But this is a very significant um, aircraft in terms of the remaining components left. So from that viewpoint, it's a very significant restoration. We've started the uh, restoration of the aircraft. So the biggest job ahead of us now is funding the rest of the restoration. So we're a not-for-profit organisation. We've been working with REC now for 18 months on this project. It means an awful lot to us that 
we're working with a partner organisation who absolutely understands the significance of Pat Hughes, understands the significance of the Spitfire and wanted to work with us with that same sense of passion that we share with them. We supplied some uh, parts of uh, aircraft skin that we couldn't use again in the restoration of the aircraft. So that was passed on to wreck watches. So that, you know, be incorporated in their watches. So you're, you're wearing a watch that as part of that aircraft that fought in the Battle of Britain with Pat Hughes at the, at the controls. I mean, this, this watch is fantastic. It, it, it just feels like a piece of Spitfire. And to think that uh, part of this watch was flying around in the Battle of Britain with Pat at the controls, it just, you know, to, you become a part of it. You feel like you're a part of history. I've, I think it's fantastic. That's excellent. Great watch. Fantastic. I'm absolutely delighted with the look of the watch. It's a superb uh, timepiece. I'm a bit of a watch collector myself, and this is a superb watch. It looks fantastic. I think it's a fantastic achievement to be able to incorporate the part of the aircraft in it. So it lives on and it keeps the spirit of Patterson Hughes alive. So I think it serves a fantastic purpose. We've worked intensely with REC watches over the last 18 months on this project and we really believe in what they're doing. I just hope that everyone really gets to enjoy this watch for what it is and be part of the future of X4009. Now I hope from the bottom of my heart you all enjoy what we're about to launch.